May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As you can see, I am not Mother Lewis this morning. Um, She is ill with COVID, so I ask that you keep her in your prayers for a speedy recovery and a quick return to each of us, especially in this first week of school, her first week as school chaplain at St. Luke. So please keep her in your prayers. This week, we return to Mark's gospel after a few weeks, quite a few, in the gospel of John. It's a stark change from our sojourn in John's gospel, and aren't we just plunged right back into the thick of it? We continue basically where we left off as Jesus continues to be questioned by the scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem. Rabbi Jesus and the Pharisees continued to be engaged in a kind of head-on collision between two very different ways of religious instruction and practice. This is where we find ourselves this morning in Mark's gospel. Now, to start, I do want to talk a little bit about who these Pharisees and scribes actually are. The Pharisees and the scribes are often positioned in the Gospels as an established and powerful group of scholars and interpreters of the Jewish law. As characters, they are often given a bad rap and painted as a kind of nemesis group to Jesus, but in reality, they are quite remarkable. Their questions are pointed in a way that implies the expertise and wisdom of generations, generations of elders and spiritual leaders, which they certainly possess themselves as they belong to a complex school of religious training and thought in the first century. While they are certainly part of a larger Jewish law tradition, traced back to Moses himself, what these Pharisees and scribes represent in the Jewish spiritual landscape of Jesus' day, however, is actually a relatively recent development in this Jewish school of thought. For historical context, the Pharisees, as they are presented in the Gospels, in Mark's Gospel in particular, are a religious sect of Jewish leadership who first became prevalent around the year 150 BC. These Pharisees are particularly notable as distinct from other scholar priests of previous eras because of their somewhat dramatic refocus on the temple and the practices of ritual purity and sacrifice which were based around this temple worship in Jerusalem. And of course, we know that in Jewish law, the concepts of purity and defilement are key in this spiritual worship. They have much to do with food and ritual as a way of setting apart, consecrating, if you will, the particular presence and work of the priest, the priest in the temple, as compared to the everyday reality or spiritual life of most people. In this way, the Levitical law, as it dictates practices around states of purity, was really only meant for the priests of the temple. Now, this this isn't to say that the law itself, that larger covenant of God, as it relates to the core Jewish spiritual values, was not necessarily to be observed by all people. We know that the law was and still is most important to the Jewish identity as a spiritual people and political community. We read this clearly in our text from Deuteronomy today. The reason why this matters is because by the time Jesus was engaging in his own life and ministry, 
the Pharisees taught their own concept of this Jewish law that claimed that temple purity, that is, the purity practices that they themselves were encountering, previously ascribed only to them, should and indeed could be practiced by all Jewish people. So here we have then a call to a somewhat more zealous vision of Jewishness that calls all people to observe every aspect of Levitical law and custom, even if it falls beyond the bounds of their everyday existence. Now, opposite this argument, we find our Jesus, who is presented in the gospel as a clear antagonist from the Pharisees' and scribes' perspective. But if we engage with Jesus for who he actually is, which I would remind you is a practicing, faithful Jewish man, I don't think we see a Jesus who rejects what the Pharisees have to say about the law and its value. What we do find, however, is a Jesus who seeks to embody the law, the faith, his faith, in a way that affirms, invites, and responds to the holiness of his people, that is, the holiness that exists within each and every one of us as we are made in the image of God. The Pharisees critique Jesus and the disciples for not washing their hands before a meal. But what they fail to see from Jesus' perspective is that in their own hyper-focused teaching on temple law, they have stumbled into a kind of spiritual blindness to the greater law, the greater covenant promise, as it lifts up and enlightens the Jewish people as a whole community. This is the heart of the law referenced in James's letter, the law that cares for the widow and the orphan, which tends to the sick and the needy, which gives to the poor and makes right what is wrong. Here, there are guidelines about sacrifice and purity in a different kind of way, the way of the heart and the way of the spirit. How can everyday life be patterned in such a way that it always seeks to manifest the flourishing of humanity while looking to God for help in doing so? This is the question I hear Jesus asking, and this is the expression of the Jewish law which I believe Jesus bears for us in the gospel. And so, to me, the ongoing conversation between Jesus and his counterparts begs the further question, in the beautiful landscape, the beautiful spiritual landscape of the Gospels, what is the pattern of Jewish practice or any religious practice at all which empowers a kind of priesthood of all believers? As we evaluate Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes in this landscape, I see the established leaders as somewhat of a group of fundamentalists. They have their core values and beliefs as derived directly from the Scriptures. Again, we hear this in Deuteronomy today, and they mean to follow them as closely as they can. In concept, there actually is nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with this desire to have a spiritual life grounded in the Scriptures. But in practice, it becomes a stumbling block in that not only does it alienate them from their own people who, for whatever reason, poverty, trade, family life, what have you, cannot attain to their very specific teachings. We can take the disciples, I think, as proof of this. But it also distracts them from a deeper and more powerful truth. Perhaps what we find Jesus modeling for us here in balance is a life and ministry that is very much at home in the covenant word of God, and all the wisdom, beauty, and holiness which we find within it, 
while also challenging the community of Israel to not forget the deeper values of promise, welcome, freedom, and justice within those covenant laws too. As we are reminded by the lectionary in various ways this morning, there is no use in a religious practice which, A, is not actually attainable by the people who are meant to follow it, as then it certainly does not honor God, or B, religious practice postured only in word, especially by those who claim to lead it, while not actually being embodied in the kind of deeds that lift up those in need, those suffering, and those on the margins around us. I hope that this feels challenging to us, but also relevant to us in our own faith lives as we continue to discern who we are meant to be as people of God in the world today. To me, it's no secret that the Episcopal Church has often been critiqued of being a bit too loosey-goosey when it comes to the practice of religion in the Christian context. Even within our own church, we find debate over core values and practice, communion without baptism, language for God, the creeds even. In the ordination vows, we priests promise to not only obey the teachings of the church as we have received them, but also to admonish those who teach against them. But what happens when we find the church at large or other Christians in the world, be them within our communion or without, to be working against the way of Jesus, to be working against the covenant promises of God. And even still, arguments about the creed or communion and baptism feel silly at times against a religio-political backdrop which seeks to advance policy and practice from a Christian perspective, which would decrease protections and rights for women, immigrants and refugees, LGBTQ people, the marginalized and the poor, and those living on the streets. Suddenly, these things don't feel so far away from first century Palestine and this chat we find between Jesus and the other spiritual leaders of his day. I'm not sure I have a very strong answer to what we face today in our spiritual texts and in the world around us, other than to lean on the value which speaks loudest to me from the life and ministry of Jesus, that whether we are bishops, priests, deacons, lay leaders, singers and musicians, school students, teachers, monastics, lawyers, doctors, nurses and caregivers, business people or creative types, whoever we are, if we claim the faith of Jesus, if we claim to be people of faith at all, we must know that we are called first and foremost to serve to serve God in the temple, that is, whatever sacred space we have in our lives before us now, and to serve Christ in one another. This is what I think the Pharisees and the scribes forgot from time to time, and this is what I believe Jesus is reminding of them of in the gospel we read today. Do not forget the call to serve. It is crucial to who we are. This, this is what makes us holy and pure. This is what makes us priests, priests of our faith before God. We must, in our doctrine and in our practice of religion, always hold fast to the words and deeds which empower us to offer ourselves in love for others and for God whose power alone is that which purifies, sanctifies, and redeems all things. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
the giver of all good gifts. In your divine providence, you have appointed various orders in your church. Give your grace, we humbly pray, to all who are called to ministry for your people, and so fill them with the truth of your doctrine and clothe them with holiness of life, that they may faithfully serve before you to the glory of your great name and for the benefit of your holy church and for the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.